Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Do you remember his name, the first man? Fernard Fouchette. He was yeah. great. Awesome. Awesome. Where, what, what territory? It was in Montreal. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I can't remember all the questions. I, I think the next one would be, uh, how many belts have you held? Belts? Do you remember? I mean, there's probably have tons of them, but... Well, I had the U.S. belt in California, and then Florida belt, numerous times, so I had weight heavyweight champion, uh, world tag team champion. I, I have probably uh, 30 or 40. Wow. Yeah. Probably, this list is probably just as long. Name me the federations that you've worked for. Uh, I've worked for almost every territory. When there's territories, I worked in San Francisco, I worked in Hawaii, I worked in, for Vince Senior, I worked for the Fullers. I probably worked in 20 territories. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know, I know you've worked at WWF, right? Yeah. You've, you've worked. Um, one of, one of the biggest things I also remember is WCW when you were yeah. the Taskmaster and you run there. You were also the Booker there. Yeah. Right. For, for how many? How long were you there as a Booker? I was there as a Booker from about ninety three to about ninety four to two thousand. Okay. Right. Now, now, can you give us your impression on Vince McMahon? What do you think of Vince? Well, we were just talking about today. His wife is running for governor of Connecticut. Yeah, they, I was informed that today. Yeah. Well. That's surely breaking into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, whatever anybody wants to say about Vince McMahon, he took wrestling and made it mainstream. Whether you like it or not, he's been hugely successful. He's risen above what wrestling was. When you get a family member running for a governor seat, that says something. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. The only thing I, you know, of course, I'm an old school fan, so I kind of like the territories, you know. Yeah. Um, there was no internet back then, as you right. know. I learned mostly about you before I actually saw you on video. I learned mostly about you through magazines, right. you know what I mean? And it was, it was kayfabe was still alive back yeah. then, too. So it was, I don't know, I kind of, I can see that I wanted it to be mainstream, you know, when I was a yeah. fan and younger growing up, but now it seems like he's eating up the whole world and there's, not, there's nothing left, you know. Well, I, we, we talked about that last night, and I said, everything has to evolve. Okay, because it doesn't evolve, it dies. And you can't go back, and the, we're in a room now, and you guys are going to produce this thing with cameras that would have to fill a room 20 years ago, correct? Right, right. right. Everything has gotten so much more technological, advanced. We have so much information at our fingertips because of the internet, right? Right. right. Okay, can we go backwards? No, I saw a thing today. In six years, there's going to be an NFL team in London. Wow. In six years. So I'm a big baseball fan. Would I w wish that the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn? Yeah. Can they perceivably go to Brooklyn? Could they have made it? Maybe. But when I was born, there was only 150 million people in this country. And they lived, three quarters lived in the east of the Mississippi. Right. Now, how many sports teams are in California uh, on right. the West Coast? Right. So it's evolution. Everything's going to evolve. Can it go back ever to the territories? I don't think so, but I do think that wrestling will evolve again. Yeah. I see wrestling evolving into a hybrid of, it's in this, I may be way off, and I've been wrong a lot of times, but when you watch an event, you want to hope it's a sporting event. Even if you know it's entertainment, you want to say, well, I know that's entertainment, but those two guys got mad at each other. That match was right. real. It was like, when I was a kid, I knew wrestling was bullshit. Yeah. Okay? I knew it. I just, you know. But I thought some of the guys were real. But when I went to the matches and saw the Sheik for the first time, I said, the building changed. There was an aura. The building changed. It was real. I said, I don't care what anybody says about wrestling. This is real. And I think that's where it's going to somewhere have to go back to. It was that match that we saw. Okay, the first six matches on this pay-per-view were choreographed and were entertaining. Was that last match? The shoot. But I think that's where it's going to end up. Do you think that's possible nowadays? Do you think it's possible to be able to, to, to make people believe in something again? Well, one of the biggest compliments I ever got was when I was booking 
and Brian Pillman and I had an angle with Brian Pillman. The Booker Man, yeah. yeah. Well, Kevin Nash was in WWF, and he called me and said, I bought that pay-per-view last night because I thought it was a shoot. Wow. So if they thought it was a shoot. The boys think it's a work, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, do I think it can go back? Yeah, I think anything can go back if the st story's laid out right. Right. You know? Right. Right. I'm, I'm hoping so, because I'd like to see that. I'd like to see, like, I want to be worked one more time. I feel like, you know, like Bobby Heenan said it best. He says, it's hard because the magic tricks, we know all the tricks now. So right. you can't do the tricks anymore. So it's like to see a new trick would be, would be great. Yeah. yeah. This is our favorite question out of the 20. Give us a rib that you've either seen or done that sticks out in your mind. Well, one of the funniest things I ever saw in my life. I went to Calgary to wrestle, and that was about 1975, 74. And when I got up there, there was a young man, his name was Ricky Martell. And the first night I saw him, I said, this kid's a star. Right. And uh, I said, you've got to get to the United States. You've got to be a kind of star. So I only stayed for six weeks, and I went back to Florida. And because of my, I was uh, like a surrogate son to Eddie, and Mike and I were close. I said, there's a kid in, in uh, Calgary that's, he's from Montreal. He's one of the most talented kids I've ever seen. He's a great baby face. I said, who is he? I said, Ricky Martel. And he said, are you going to vouch for him? I said, yeah. I said, he's great. So I called him up two weeks later. He was in Florida. Um, and then I eventually went to Atlanta. And the rest was history. You know, he was an AWA champion. And then did, had the great run in New York. But anyway, Ricky was a young boy. He was about 17 years old. So we used to do this thing with the young guys. Is We got Ricky and said, listen, the interstates weren't all the way finished in Florida, so you had to get off the Highway 60, then you went to Miami, go back down Highway 60, which was a real deserted road. Except there was a Stuckey's as you got off. That was, you know, right. a truck stop. And it was the only place you could get food for 100 miles. So we told Ricky, we said, hey, get back in the truck and get 